Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Sakwa, cardiac surgeon and chief of cardiovascular surgery for the Memorial Care Heart and Vascular Institute. Today, my colleagues and I will be sharing important information with you about atrial fibrillation, which is called AFib for short. We plan to share exactly what AFib is and what the common signs and symptoms are. We're gonna talk about who the condition typically affects along with risk factors, and then share some important, exciting information about minimally invasive approaches to treating this problem. Most importantly, we're going to share with you how the care team at Saddleback Medical Center collaborates together to provide the best possible outcomes for our patients. Now let's go inside and let me introduce you to my colleague, Dr. Howard Fruman. Uh, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, I grew up there, did all my undergraduate schooling in the Detroit area, then went to the University of Michigan. And uh, from there went to Wayne State Medical School, which is also downtown Detroit. After that, I started my journeys. I went to California for my medical residency in San Diego, back to Detroit to train in cardiology, and then to New York to train in electrophysiology and pacing. But, you know, that's just my education. My personal life is that I married my high school sweetheart. We will be having our 48th wedding anniversary. I have two beautiful children, each married. Each has two more beautiful children. And I spend a lot of my time pretending to be five years old again with my grandchildren. I uh, have a lot of hobbies. Uh, I ski, I golf, I paint, I play guitar. So I don't have any problem killing time or entertaining my family. It's interesting, I had two pivotal moments during my training. The first one occurred when I was a second year medical resident. When you're an intern, you go to CPR as an extra pair of hands and people are shouting and do this and do that and you're just following instructions of, of another leader. Uh, when you become a medical resident, you're in charge. And the first time I went to a code blue and I stood at the foot of the bed in charge, I just had a moment where the room quieted down and I saw what everybody was doing and I gave everybody instructions in a loud voice and I knew I could do it. And until that time, I didn't know if I had the inner strength to be a cardiologist. And uh, at that moment, I knew I did. Atrial fibrillation is called the grandfather of cardiac arrhythmias because we have recognized it and studied it the longest. You don't have to be a grandfather to get atrial fibrillation, but age plays a factor. AFib occurs in 1% of the general population at age 60, and an additional half percent every year after that. If you are lucky enough to live to 90, you have a 15 to 20% chance of getting AFib. If you have other medical conditions such as obesity, hypertension, coronary artery disease, valvular heart disease, pulmonary disease, sleep apnea, these numbers double to 30 or 40 percent lifetime risk of AFib. As a doctor trying to understand AFib, it also doesn't hurt to be a grandfather and to see all the trial and tribulations of treatment of this very nuanced condition over the last half century. AFib is a rapid and chaotic heartbeat. For most people, this is very uncomfortable. It causes palpitations, dizziness, fatigue, and shortness of breath. It makes blood pressure harder to control and contributes to eventual dementia. These are big issues, but not the biggest issue with AFib. The biggest issue is stroke. AFib significantly increases the risk of stroke. In the normal heart, blood is efficiently whisked through the chambers into the circulation. In AFib, blood can pool in the nooks and crannies between the muscle fibers. If it pools, it may solidify like cooling jello. If it 
solidifies and breaks loose, it may flow to the brain and cause a stroke. Taking blood thinners prevents these tiny pools from clotting and reduces the risk of stroke almost back to normal. Of course, taking blood thinners can make it easier to bruise or bleed, but the risk of life-threatening bleeding is much, much less than the risk of stroke. This is a major public health issue. Less than half the people in the United States who should be taking blood thinners take them. The consequence is thousands of preventable strokes every year. Anticoagulation has always been a problem for those people who are prone to bleeding. For these patients, we have developed methods that can eliminate the need for blood thinners. One method is to surgically remove the appendage or small pocket where 90% of the blood clots form. Another less invasive approach is to place a device called the Watchman. The Watchman device prevents clots from leaving the appendage and is equally effective at preventing strokes as blood thinners. Saddleback has become the most prolific hospital in Orange County to use the Watchman device. Once a patient has been properly protected from stroke, we can try to coax the rhythm back to normal. Antiarrhythmics are special medicines that soothe the abnormal firing of the heart while leaving the normal firing alone. Sometimes they will bring the rhythm back to normal on their own. In other cases, we can reboot the heart with or without antiarrhythmics. To do this, we administer sedation while the patient is asleep and unable to feel or remember pain. We pass an electric current through the heart, like what you have seen on TV, but much more controlled. This causes all the cells to fire at once, very much like rebooting a computer. It is very effective, but it doesn't really change the underlying factors that brought on AFib in the first place. This is where it starts to get interesting. Over the last decade, we have developed techniques where we can enter the bloodstream with catheters that are thin tubes about the caliber of a pen refill, but about three feet long. This is the catheter we use when we're applying heat. It has a deflectible tip so that we can navigate it anywhere we want to in the heart. Electricity passes through the tip into the tissue and the resistance creates heat. This lesion that we make is about the size of a punch hole on a piece of paper. We call this procedure ablation. Ablations are done every working day at Saddleback. And here's where heart surgeons like Dr. Sakwa and Altshuler come in. When we return, you'll hear from Dr. Altshuler about the surgical aspects of atrial fibrillation and how we combine our talents to produce the best outcome for our patients. At the Memorial Care Breast Centers, our sole focus is to save lives through annual mammograms. We've implemented the following safety measures to keep you safe during your appointment. All patients are screened upon entry and will be asked to wear a mask. Waiting areas and dressing rooms have been rearranged and are being disinfected more frequently. Appointment times are staggered for social distancing. All staff are screened upon entry and wear appropriate PPE. Our standalone breast centers are located throughout our communities and with easily accessible locations from Long Beach to Rancho Mission Viejo, we're here for you, close to home. I'm uh, a Detroit native, lived in Detroit in the suburbs all through high school. Stayed a little local for college, went to the University of Michigan, uh, followed by med school at Wayne State University in Detroit, and general surgery residency at the Detroit Medical Center at Detroit Receiving Hospital, then ventured a little bit west, not quite this far west, to Salt Lake City for cardiac training at the University of Utah. There gained a fair experience in transplant surgery and originally went back to Detroit at Henry Ford Hospital. Uh, it was a great opportunity in that both me and my wife's family were in Detroit, they had a young child at the time, so grandparents were around, and the opportunity to join Ford Hospital and be part of their transplant program presented itself, so that's why I came back to Detroit. Uh, shortly after that, the particular surgeon, Don McGilligan, who I came to work with, left, and I knew 
Beaumont Hospital was looking to start a heart transplant program and they recruited me there to get that off the ground and that's where I met Dr. Sakwa 31, 32 years ago and we've been working together ever since. Outside of the hospital, um, you know, Southern California is fabulous. I love all outdoor activities, uh, ski all winter if I could, backpacking, biking in the summer and can do pretty much all of that year round in Southern California. It's a great uh, time of life to make a change. Kids have gone, grown up and now are out of the house and so they're not uh, have the opportunity to see another part of the world, experience another part of what, what medicine is. One of the greatest benefits of treating patients at Saddleback is collaborating with other cardiovascular experts to ensure we're delivering the highest quality, comprehensive care to our patients. Cardiovascular surgeons have always been immersed in this process with electrophysiologists. First, because so many of the cardiac conditions, particularly valve disease, can also lead to atrial fibrillation. And second, because the incidence of atrial fibrillation after surgery is not uncommon. The operating room provides a unique opportunity that is not available to electrophysiologists. Direct visualization of the heart gives the surgeons a leg up in creating areas of electrical blockage and also produces the opportunity to remove the atrial appendage, as Dr. Fruman mentioned, is the source of 90% of the strokes, rendering anticoagulation unnecessary. Similar to the catheter procedures described by Dr. Fruman, at the time of valve surgery, we can also create a maze procedure, which can redirect the electrical impulses in an orderly fashion necessary to treat atrial fibrillation. These procedures can be done with minimally invasive cardiac procedures without adding any significant risk. Oftentimes, combining these procedures with the valve procedure can eliminate the recurrence of atrial fibrillation. The cardiovascular surgeon, working in collaboration with the electrophysiologist, can combine their efforts in what is called convergent therapy. The cardiovascular surgeon will apply the heat or cold ablation to the outside surface of the heart, while the electrophysiologist can then do the ablation to the inside of the heart. This approach produces better accuracy by combining direct visualization and better through and through penetration. This collaboration makes a cure for atrial fibrillation accessible for many patients who otherwise could not be treated. The convergent procedures use minimally invasive techniques for a quicker recovery. At Saddleback, we are blessed with a great team of experienced electrophysiologists, cardiac surgeons, and cardiac anesthesiologists that can look at your situation as unique, provide you with the information, options and expertise to help you decide what is right for you. I'm Dr. Mark Sackwood, Chief of Cardiovascular Surgery for Memorial Care. I just completed a minimally invasive aortic valve replacement. This patient had aortic stenosis with increasing symptoms of shortness of breath, chest pain, and dizziness. Without surgery, there could have been dire consequences, including potential loss of life. If you have symptoms, please don't delay your care. We are here for you. I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. When I was about 10 years old, we moved just outside the city limits into a suburban area. Spent uh, my entire high school time in the Detroit area and then went to college in Rhode Island at Brown University and medical school in New York City at Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. When I finished medical school, I did my training in Boston at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and then my cardiac surgery training back to New York City at New York University. I was fortunate there to have studied under 
two great teachers, Steve Colvin and Dr. Frank Spencer, who's one of the fathers of cardiac surgery. When I finished in New York, I went back to Michigan where I spent 32 years in the same practice. I actually practiced with Dr. Jeffrey Allshuler for almost 31 of the 32 years, I believe. He's much older than I am, in case you didn't realize that. The, um, in uh, Michigan, we were the builders of a large program that eventually merged into a health system that we had three cardiac surgery programs. Dr. Allshore and I worked mainly at the, the large hospital where we performed over 900 procedures per year. About uh, a year ago, we became interested in getting to a, a nicer climate and, and trying to see if, if whether or not uh, we could duplicate the success we had in Michigan and were offered this fantastic opportunity to come to Southern California and work for Memorial Care. And we're very glad to be here. My only thing I enjoy doing outside of practicing heart surgery is golf. And now I get to play all year round. So I'm glad to be here and look forward to being a part of this community. So we, years ago. <laughs> we, we both known uh, Dr. Fruman, uh, both personally and professionally, for 30 plus years. Um, or did your dad know his dad? Oh God, for 40, 50 years. So Dr. Fruman was a cardiologist at the hospital that we worked at in Detroit, and we were all very close. We would golf together, take care of patients together. In fact, one of the meetings that we came to was in Laguna Nagal, was a Beaumont cardiology, cardiac surgery meeting in Laguna Nagal. And at that time, little did I know that Howard Fruman was actually interviewing to work at Saddleback Hospital while we were out here at this meeting. Um, so we, ne we never really kept in touch very often until about a year and a half ago when he actually called us and recruited us to come here. I think that Saddleback Medical Center is the best of the lot in Orange County. That Saddleback has become the cleanest, most tightly run, uh, with the highest level of medical expertise. So I think in a very short time since we've been here, Saddleback's cardiac surgery program, I, I really believe it's gone to a whole different level. We offer almost everything that we've ever done in our careers, except, maybe, heart except heart transplantation. Um, we're doing high-risk coronary bypass surgery. We're taking care of all types of different valvular heart disease. Uh, you just did a big case replacing, and you did a complex aortic case here as well the other day, replacing the aorta and the valve. So I am very excited about the fact that I think this program now offers more state-of-the-art cardiac surgical procedures and techniques than probably any other program in the area. And that's exciting yeah, for us. I agree with that. You can't, you can't step in and do those cases unless you have the nurses, unless you have the intensive care, unless you have the anesthesia support to do that. So I think, you know, I've been very pleased and I think we settle back, we can do basically anything short of a heart transplant here. As surgeons feel comfortable doing that. Right. Not wondering what's going to happen to the patient once you leave the operating room. I agree. I think it's, uh, it's an exciting place right now to, to work and in a great place to have your heart care, in my opinion. And I also believe that our cardiology group here is top notch. We have multiple uh, cardiologists that do state-of-the-art interventional procedures and work together with the surgical team to really build this high quality, you know, team-driven well, I mean, outcomes. Yeah, taking care of any, any heart problem is not just a surgeon, it's not just a cardiologist. It's really collaboration in a collegial co uh, collaboration. I'm very concerned that patients with stroke, heart attack, sepsis, or other medical emergencies are delaying care. Let me reassure you, it is safe and critically important that you do not ignore the signs and symptoms such as chest discomfort, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, or sudden onset of headache. If you think you may be having a medical emergency, don't wait, call 911 
or go to your nearest emergency room. Late in the year uh, 2017, I did start to notice that I was having some uh, shortness of breath and some lightheadedness, and I kind of just chalked it up to maybe aging issues at the time. Uh, but then uh, I was noticing it even more when I'd go to the gym to do my exercising. Then in uh, early 2018, I went to an appointment with a, a hernia surgeon for a hernia operation I was going to need, and the nurse identified that I had very elevated heart rate and said I should have it looked into right away. When I called the uh, memorial care, uh, my normal provider, uh, they said uh, that could be something serious. You should probably get it taken care of right away, even going to the emergency room. So I actually did go to the emergency room at Saddleback Hospital, and they looked me over and identified that I had atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation, and gave me the appropriate medications at that time, and then referred me to the South Orange County uh, Cardiology Group which is where I went then for an appointment soon thereafter. And they, of course, confirmed that that was the condition I was under. And then we started to monitor it and make plans to have the ablation procedure, which was performed by Dr. Fruman. The most rewarding aspect is when you've taken care of a patient and you've done a good job and they've gotten a lot, lot better. And they come in and are beaming with happiness about how well they feel. That's what we live for. That's the moment we live for. Well, as, as a patient of memorial care, I had really uh, a good results. Uh, it went smooth for me. Uh, as, a, as I said, people were very professional. Uh, it, uh, uh, it, 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 it allowed me to get back to the quality of life. Again, I knew I, had, I, knew I definitely wanted to do the procedure. There was no doubt in my mind that I, I didn't want to try and live with the uh, elevated heart rate. I knew I had to have this corrective a procedure that was done called ablation. And we did that, and uh, uh, it's, you know, now I'm, you know, I'm doing the things in my life that I want to be able to do. So it was uh, uh, no doubt for me that that's what I wanted to do, and it turned out to be successful. We're running into patients five years after their surgery, or running into, you know, I, I, there's one Christmas card I get every year from a patient's mom, young kid I did a dissection on, and I look forward to that card every year. Um, to seeing the patient five, ten years down the line, that, that, uh, that to me is the best part. Yeah, I think the most rewarding part for me is having somebody come back to the office after you've done their heart operation and they're recovering, they're back to doing their activities and they look at you and they just say, thank you, doctor. Um, I feel so much better and I, I can't thank you enough. I, that, that's just the most important and rewarding part for me. Um, you know, I've already said that my career has been blessed. Uh, I've had a chance to be in this from the beginning. I've had a chance to be in three different medical centers, have 30 or 40 different partners. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm delighted to be living in California now. And uh, uh, I, I have... Uh, uh, never any second thoughts that I should have done something else or I could have done something else. I've always felt that it's just an honor to do this job.
Anybody recognize it? <laughs> I started singing. <laughs> All of me.